for this opportunity to gather to hear your words. Uh, please bless, Pastor. Please bless the message. Please um, open our hearts so that we can receive your words and help us to focus and concentrate on what you're preaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, before we get into the sermon this morning, I do have one baptism certificate to hand out. If I could have one of the ushers come up and help me. And uh, we have... Let me read it. Certificate of Baptism. This certificate is awarded to Terry A. Randolph in recognition of his baptism on the 8th day of, the, of May of the year 2016, presented by Verity Baptist Church in the verse Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And we've got some pictures here for Terry to remember his baptism. And let's give him a round of applause. We like baptisms at Verity Baptist Church. All right, keep your finger there in Galatians chapter number 3, and go with me just real quickly to the book of Jude. If you find the last book in the Bible, it's the book of Revelation. Right before the book of Revelation, you have the book of Jude. If you could find the book of Jude, and let me go in and ask this. Who is cold? Are you cold? If you're cold, raise your hand. All right, we got... Okay, who is fine? Just leave it the way it is. All right, the fines have it. Okay, so we're going to leave it there then. And uh, Jude, chapter number one. Jude, well, there's only one chapter. Jude, and I'd like you to look down at verse number one. Jude and verse number one. The Bible says this, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This morning we're beginning a brand new series entitled Earnestly Contend for the Faith. And we get the title of the series from Jude 1 and verse 3, where Jude said, When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. That word common in front of the word salvation there, what he's saying is the salvation that we all have in common. Because he's talking to believers and he was saying, you know, we're all saved. And Lord willing, this morning, you're saved this morning. If you're not, we want to try to get you saved or explain to you how you can be saved. But Jude said, I want to write to you of the common salvation. And then he said this. He said, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Here's what he's saying. He said, I want to write to you about salvation, but when I thought about it, he said, I realized that what I really needed to write about is about the fact that we need to earnestly contend for the faith. We need to earnestly fight for and defend the faith. You say, well, why do we have to contend for the faith? Notice verse 4. He says, uh, he says for... He's saying, because there are certain men crept in unawares. The word unawares there meaning without being aware of the situation or coming in secretly who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. He's saying there are men, there are prophets, false prophets, ungodly men who have crept in unawares, who have snuck in to what we would call Christianity and they are teaching a false salvation. They are teaching false doctrines in regards to salvation. And he said, because of that, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. And this morning we're beginning a, a series. We're going to spend maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks on the subject of defending salvation and what does it mean to be saved and the attacks on salvation. Now you're there in the book of Jude. I'd like you to just turn a, a, a couple of pages over to the book of First John. If you go backwards there, you're going to uh, right before the book of Jude. You've got uh, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Go to 1st John, chapter number 5, and I'd like you to notice verse number 13. 1st John, chapter number 5, and verse number 13. The Bible says you got Jude, just right before Jude, you got 3rd, 2nd, and 1st John. 1st John 5, 13. Notice what the Bible says. John said, wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He said, these things have I written unto you. He's talking about the Word of God. 
He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. He said that ye may know that ye have eternal life. If you don't mind underlining in your Bible, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, I'd like you to underline that expression that ye may know that ye have eternal life. He said, one of the reasons that, I, that God gave us the Bible, one of the reasons that God gave us His Word is that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is why we train our soul winners when we go out into the community to preach the gospel. We train our soul winners to ask the question, do you know if you were to die today, if you would go to heaven or hell, or maybe you're not sure, you never even thought about it. And you say, why do you ask that? Because here's what God said. He said, you can know that ye have eternal life. So, so often people will say, to us like well nobody can really know that well I'm, I'm hoping I make it to heaven I'm hoping that God allows me into heaven but the Bible says that you can know you can have that assurance that you are saved but today there is much false religion today there is much false uh, teaching that is attacking the the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of the Word of God now go go back with me to the book of Galatians we were there in Galatians 3 that's the chapter that was read this morning we're going to be in Galatians uh, for a while, going back and forth. I want you to understand this. This morning's sermon is going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of Bible study. All right, it's going to be. I don't know that there's going to be a lot of yelling and screaming and pounding the pulpit. Maybe there will be. I don't know. If I got to wake you up, you know, I might have to pound the pulpit or something. But we're 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 going to look at this theology of work salvation, and we're talking about work salvation this morning, and those who would add works to salvation and how the Bible teaches against that. Now let me go ahead and say this. In Philippians 3.1, and you don't have to turn there, Philippians 3.1 says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. This is what Paul said. He said, To write the same thing unto you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Some of you are, are saying, Well, I already know that works is not part of salvation, and I'm pretty uh, you know, understanding of this. But I would encourage you to take notes this morning, because here's what you need to do, is you need to teach others also. You need to be able to pr present this information to someone else. When, we, when I preach, you know, and when preachers preach, we don't preach to be heard. We preach to be repeated. We try to preach in a way that makes sense to you so that then you can go and take that information and share it with someone else, repeat it to someone else, teach others also. I would encourage you to say, well, I, I know salvation is not, not of works. But take notes this morning because we're going to look at a lot of passages and there's a lot of things that might be helpful for you in your own soul winning and evangelism. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know that I have eternal life or I don't really know what I think about adding works to salvation. I'm not even really sure what that means. Well, listen up, you know, and pay attention and let's study this thing out together and look at what the Bible says. Now, you're there in the book of Galatians. We read Galatians chapter 3, but I'd like you to turn back to Galatians chapter 2 just for a minute. And I'm going to make some statements this morning. I'd like you to write them down if you are able to, if you don't have a child on your lap or something like that. I'd like you to take a moment to write these statements down as we study them out together. And when we're talking about adding works to salvation, we're talking about the idea of that we have to do something in order to be saved. This idea that if I'm going to go to heaven when I die, I have to Fill in the blank. And usually it's this idea of keeping the commandments. Usually it's an idea of I've got to, you know, uh, keep the Ten Commandments. So I've got to go to church or I have to repent of my sins or I have to get baptized. I have to live a good life. Now, please understand what I'm saying. All of those things are good things. It's good to go to church. It's good to get baptized. It's good to repent of your sins. It's good to live a, uh, uh, a good life. But if you are basing your salvation on the fact that I do X, Y, and Z, then you believe in a works salvation. And here's what you need to understand. This is the attack on the doctrine of salvation. I don't know of a more important doctrine than the doctrine of where you're going to spend eternity when you die. I mean, the most important decision you can make in your life is the decision to be saved because it will base the, 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 your eternity. That's why at Verity Baptist Church, we put a big emphasis on soul winning. We go out into the community and we don't just hand out invitations. We don't just send letters in the mail. We confront people, not rude or not mean, but what we mean by that is we go to people, we open our mouths, and we clearly communicate the gospel to them because what they believe about salvation will determine if they spend eternity in heaven or in hell. Now here's what I need you to understand. Satan and the devil, the devil has tricked us into thinking. And so many times people will say to me, you know, how do you know which one's the right religion? There's so many hundreds and thousands of beliefs out there and so many religions. But here's what you need to understand. There's really only two ways of belief in this world. 
You either believe that salvation is by grace through faith, Meaning you receive salvation, has nothing to do with you, has nothing to do with anything you've ever done. All you ever did is by faith accepted the gift that God gave you. Or you believe that salvation has something to do with the way you live your life or the things that you do. And look, I'm not trying to offend you this morning, but here's what you need to understand. 99.9% .9 of religions today teach that salvation is by works or they'll add uh, works to salvation. The Roman Catholic Church this morning will tell you that salvation is through Jesus Christ, but you have to get baptized, but you have to be catechized, but you have to go to the confessional booth, but you have to keep the seven sacraments. The Pentecostal Church this morning will tell you salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ, but you have to repent of your sins, but you need to be baptized. I mean, there are Baptists who will teach you that you have to repent of your sins. There are Baptists that will teach you you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life, which means that you do whatever he tells you to do like he's the boss. You know, there are, you, you say, pick the one you want. Muslims, basically comes down to you follow our rules and you're a good enough uh, Muslim, then you'll make it to whatever they call heaven. You know, Buddhism teaches, you know, if you live a good enough life, you treat people well enough, then you're going to get reincarnated, not as an ant, but as a falcon or whatever, you know. Uh, you're going to get to nirvana. You know, whatever they teach, Buddhism, they, Hinduism, all religions come down to this one idea. Your eternity is dependent on the things you do on this earth. Even Calvinists will, will try to lie and they'll say, you know, they'll say, oh, no, no, no. We believe it's all, it's all grace. It has nothing to do with your work. But then they'll teach the perseverance of the saints, which means that if you don't persevere, which means that if you, don't, if you quit before you die, you know, if you backslide, then you weren't ever really saved. Here's what they're saying. There has to be works to prove your salvation. People will teach this. You got non-denominational, you know, uh, uh, congregations today and people being taught, well, you got to, it, it, it's by faith, but you got to live a good life. Or it's by faith, but if you don't add works, then you weren't really saved. And they're constantly trying to add works to salvation. And here's the question that we've got to ask. What does the Bible say? See, it doesn't really matter what the Baptists say. It doesn't really matter what the Pentecostals say. It doesn't really matter what the Catholics say. It doesn't really matter what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses teach? Basically, you're a good enough Jehovah's Witness, then you'll get resurrected and you'll uh, be part of the 144,000. What do the Mormons teach? That if you keep the commandments of the Book of Mormon and you follow their laws, then hopefully God... Every religion in the world teaches work salvation in one way or another. It's not, it's not that there's thousands of views out there. There's two views out there. Are you counting on yourself or are you counting on the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Now, you've got to ask this question, well, what does the Bible teach? Well, let's look at it. I'd like you to like to write these statements down. Number one, and like I said, this morning's going to be more of a, of a teaching. Now, I want you to write these notes down because I want you to be able to teach them to others. And I want you to be able to review them for yourself. Number one, we are not justified by the works of the law. The Bible is very clear that we are not justified by the words of the law or by keeping the commandments. Are you there in Galatians chapter 2? I'd like you to look down at verse number 16. Notice what Paul said. I mean, tell me if this is clear in Scripture or not. Knowing that a man is, notice, not justified by the works of the law. Now look, we could just say amen, close the sermon, and be done. Now, I know some of you would like that, but we're not going to do that, all right? But, you know, we can just come up to this verse and say, hey, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, and we should be done with it. We're not done with it. We're going to prove it up and down through the Bible today. But he says, look, we're not justified by the works of the law, but, but, notice what he says, by faith of Jesus Christ. So how are we justified? Not by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus. You see that word believe? The word believe means faith. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified, notice what he says, by the faith of Christ. And just to make sure you understand, he says, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I mean, could he make it more clear? He keeps repeating himself and just stating the same thing over and over, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in sight. And let me say this, some of you are already offended and you already lost you because I mentioned the Catholic Church, or because I mentioned, you know, Pentecostals or whatever. But listen, are you going to allow someone to tell you a false doctrine is going to send you to hell? Or are you going to say, well, let me at least check out what the Bible says. 
let me at least look at what the Bible says. I mean, could it be that the Bible says something different when, when God's word says here that we're not justified by works? We're justified by faith. We believe in Jesus. We're justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. I mean, that, I, I, I think that's a pretty clear statement in Scripture. And, and, and that's just a foundational thing. Number one, we're not justified by the works of the law. But let me say this. Number two, if you'd write the statement down, I'd appreciate it. Number two, if we could be justified by the law, then Jesus died for no reason. Amen. If we could be justified by the law, then why did Jesus die? Then he died in vain. Are you there in Galatians chapter 2? Look down at verse number 21. Notice what he says. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law. Now that's a big if. He, he's saying, if, if you're right, I can be saved by going to the confessional booth. I can be saved by getting baptized. I can be saved by stop smoking, stop drinking, get off drugs, repent of my sins. If I, if I can just stop sinning and that will save me. He says, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, why did Jesus die if I could just keep the Ten Commandments and go to heaven? I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous to think. Here's why Jesus died, because you and I can't keep the commandments and go to heaven. Here's why he died, because we needed a sacrifice. We needed someone to take our shame and our guilt and our sin, and we cannot be saved by the law. I said, number one, we are not justified by the works of the law. Keeping the commandments will not save you. Number two, if we could be justified by the law, then Jesus died for no reason. If we could be justified by keeping rules, then there's no reason why Jesus came. All that God would have to do is given us the law and said, here, keep it. And if you can keep it, then you'll make it. But he sent the son to die on the cross. Why? Because we couldn't keep the law. Number three, would you write the statement down? If we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. If we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. Can you go to Galatians chapter 3? Look at verse number 10. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Galatians 3.10. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Notice what he says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Here's what he's saying. If you believe that salvation is by the works of the law, by keeping the commandments, by doing certain things, he says you're actually under a curse. You say, why? For it is written. Notice, cursed is everyone that continueth not, notice this phrase, in all things. Do you see that? Which are written in the book of the law to do them. Do you see that? He said, look, if you think you got to keep the law, you're a cursed individual. Why? Because you're cursed. Here's why. Because if you think you got to keep one part of the law, then you must keep the entire law and you must continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Did you know that there's way more commandments in the Bible than just the Ten Commandments? Those are just the highlights. Those are just the, the, the general ones. I mean, there's commandments all over the, the Word of God. And here's what God says. If you think that you can get yourself to heaven, save yourself by keeping the law, then he's, he said, here's the catch to that. You've got to keep all of it. You've got to keep all of it. And, 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 and Paul gives us an example of this. You're there in Galatians 3. Go a couple of pages over to Galatians chapter 5. Now, let me explain something to you about this sermon, okay? I'm going to show you a lot of verses from Galatians and Romans just to make it easy for us as we study. I was telling my wife, you know, as I was preparing the sermon, these are my least favorite types of sermons to study for, and here's why. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence. I mean, verse, I mean, chapter after chapter and book after book, there is verse after verse after verse that proves that salvation is not of works. There are so many verses that I can't even start, you know. I, I just have to start by just crossing out entire books and saying, okay, I'm not going to go to this book in the sermon. I'm not going to go to this book in the sermon. I'm not, that's a good verse, but I'm not going to go there because there's so many verses. I mean, we'd be here for eight hours. And so I'm showing you a lot of verses this morning, but I don't want you to think like, oh, he's showing them all out of Galatians. No, I'm doing that to help you out just so that we can not be here for three hours. But there's verses all over the Bible. And if you're interested, I can give you a list uh, of, of verses that I came up with. Galatians chapter 5. Notice what he says in verse 1. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is Paul speaking to the church of Galatia. He says, don't go back to the bondage that you used to be in. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free. Notice verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, let me explain what he's teaching here. 
This is a church that was teaching. They were teaching that if you're going to be saved, you have to believe on Jesus Christ, but you also have to be circumcised. They were going back to that Old Testament law. That's why he's saying, hey, stand fast in the liberty where you are standing and don't go back to the bondage because they were saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. Now notice what Paul says. He says, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, verse 2, Christ shall profit you nothing. Here's what he's saying. As soon as you add any work to salvation, then the work that Christ did for you means nothing. It's not, you know, well, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but I'm also going to add this. No, as soon as you add something to it, you disannul his sacrifice. And here's what he said. He said, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Notice verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Now notice what he said. He says, Let me tell you people who think that you got to get circumcised to be saved. He says that he is a debtor to do the whole law. He said, look, if you think that getting circumcised is going to save you, you can't just pick and choose the one sin that you think, you know, the one commandment that you got to keep in order to go to heaven. He said, as soon as you add a commandment to salvation, you got, you're a debtor to do the whole law. You don't have to turn there, but James 2.10 says this, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You can't, you can't just say, well, you know, I'm just going to keep this commandment. No, no, no. And, and, and by the way, let me say this. You can add to that. You know, when he says, you know, uh, if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. That if you be circumcised, uh, that is, uh, for I testify against every man that is circumcised, that he's a debtor to the whole law. You can remove the word circumcised and add whatever you want in there, and it'll still be true. Look, you know, for I testify again to every man that it thinks they have to get baptized to be saved. He's a debtor to do the whole law. For I testify again to everyone who thinks they have to quit smoking to be saved, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. For I testify again to everyone who thinks that they have to quit fornicating to be saved, that he's a debtor to do the whole law. When you add anything, for I testify again to every man that thinks they need to go into a confessional booth in order to go to heaven, or have the last rites read to them in order to go to heaven, or get baptized in order to go to heaven, or speak in tongues in order to go to heaven, whatever you want to add has to pray facing a certain direction seven times a day in order to go to heaven. If you think you've got to do anything to go to heaven, then you've got to do everything that God said to do. He says, look, here's what you need to understand. If we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. Amen. Number four, if we could be justified by the law, then God would have chosen that as a way for salvation. If we could be justified by the law, then God would have chosen that as a way for our salvation and not sacrifice his son. Are you there in Galatians? Look at chapter 3, verse 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. Galatians 3.21, notice what the Bible says. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Notice what he says. If there had been a law given, which could have given life. Because law, the law does not give life. The law only condemns. The law only kills. The law only get, brings death. He says, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. He says, look, if, if there was a, a commandment, God would have said, just do this one thing and, you, and that'll save you. Then God would have done that and not sacrificed his son. But that law doesn't exist. See, the problem is we have a misunderstanding about the law of God. So, number one, I said this morning, we are not justified by works, but by the law. Number two, if we could be justified by the law, then, Je then Jesus died in, uh, for no reason. He died in vain. Number three, if we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. Number four, if we could have been justified by the law, then God would have chosen that as a way for salvation and not sacrifice His Son. Number five, the law cannot save us because we are all sinners. Amen. The law cannot save us because we are all sinners. You're there in Galatians 3, 21. Look down at verse number 22. Notice what he says. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. He said the scripture hath concluded all under sin, and because we're all under sin, then the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that not do, but believe. Now, keep your finger there in Galatians 3 and go, go with me to the book of Romans. We're going to go back and forth between Galatians and Romans for a little bit. So I want you to keep your finger in Galatians 3 and go to Romans chapter number 3. Let me show this to you from the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 3. 
Romans chapter number 3. These are good things for you to teach your unsaved friends. These are good things for you to teach your, uh, you know, unbelief. And you say, well, what about, you know, non-denominationals out there? You now, what do they believe? What about the Nazarenes? What about, you know, what about all these people that, that you say, well, they're not, they're not, you know, in, in that camp of works. Here's where they're all in works. They teach that you can lose your salvation. And we'll get, we're going to get there in this series and we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, here's what you need to understand. All false religion teaches work salvation. Are you there in Romans chapter 3? Look at verse number 10. Notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Yesterday, my wife and I were out soul winning and we had these four young boys walk up. They were walking down the street and we started talking to them, giving them the gospel. And one of the young, I, I, I asked them, you know, do you know for sure that day you go to heaven? And, and one said, I don't know. And, and one of them said, yeah, I think I'm on my way to heaven. And I said, well, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? And he said, well, you know, I'm not a sinner. And his friends started laughing. And they're like, what are you talking about? Of course you're a sinner, you know? And he's like, and he's, he's arguing with them like, what sin? Tell me, what sin have you didn't me do? You know, and, he's, he, and I took him to this verse. And I said, look, the Bible says, you know, there's none righteous, no, not one. And I said, do you agree with that? And he said, well, I guess I do agree with that, you know? I said, have you ever lied before? He's like, yeah, I've lied. I'm like, well, then you're a sinner. He's like, oh, okay, you're right. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. There, and by the way, they got saved. Praise the Lord. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. You weren't seeking God. God was seeking you. Don't forget that. People say, oh, you know, uh, I found God. No, no, no. God wasn't lost. You were lost. He found you. You know, you know I, found, I found Jesus. No, Jesus found you. There's none that seeketh after God. Look at verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. They are all become unprofitable. Notice, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. People will often say to us when we're out soul winning, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'll, think I'll go to heaven because I'm a pretty good person. Hey, the Bible says there's none that doeth good. You say, well, I mean, I'm a pretty good person. But here's what you need to understand. Remember Jesus said, Jesus said that the only one that does good is God. Amen. See, the standard for good is God. You're not, you say, well, I'm good, but here's the problem. You're not good enough. You don't meet the standard of God. That's why he says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. See, the law cannot save because we're all sinners. Here's the point. If the law could save you, it would save you because you keep the law. But here's the problem. We don't keep the law. We break the law. And you say, but I've never killed anyone. But you told the lie before. The Bible says, the Bible says, you know, that we're all, we've all broken the law at some point. So because of that, the law cannot save us because we are all sinners. We did not keep the law. We broke the law. The law can only save those who keep the law. And no one, no one keeps the law. Keep your finger there in Romans 3. Go back to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to come back to Romans in a minute. Keep your finger there in Romans 3. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Let me give you the sixth statement this morning. Point number six. The law shows us our guilt in order for us to see our need for a Savior. Let me say that again. I'd like you to write it down. The law shows us our guilt in order for us to see our need of a Savior. See, we messed up when we saw the law and said, okay, here's the rule book. And I've got to just keep this law and then I'll go to heaven. No, no, no. That's not the purpose of the law. The law was given to show you that you needed Jesus. Because the problem with you and I is that we think we're good. We think, I'm not that bad. I've never killed anyone. I, you know, I've never robbed a bank. I don't think I've done bad enough to go to, go, to, go to hell. And then God says, no, no, let me show you that you are guilty. Let me show you that you are bad so that you will call upon someone to save you. Are you there in Galatians 3? Look at verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. What's the word schoolmaster mean? It's, it's an old word. It means teacher or instructor. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. The law was our teacher. The law was our instructor to bring us unto Christ that we might, don't miss it, be justified by faith. Are we, the law, no, God gave us the law so that we could be justified by work. No, no, no. God gave us the law so it would bring us to Christ so we could be justified by faith. Notice verse 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Why are you trying to keep the law to get yourself to heaven when you're in Jesus Christ? He said if you're in Christ through faith, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. Keep your finger there in, in Galatians. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Romans chapter 3 verse 19. 
Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 19. Notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know, Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Why? Why does the law speak to us? Romans 3 19. Notice. Now we know that whatsoever thing the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Why? Notice. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. See, you're not going to get to heaven and tell God, you know, well, I think I should go to heaven because, you know, I used to do drugs and I quit doing drugs. Now, look, I think you ought to quit doing drugs. But if you think quitting drugs is going to get you to heaven, you're going to die and go to hell. You say, well, I, you know, I think I should go to, go, go, go to heaven, God, because, you know, I used to live a really bad life and I used to be involved in this and I used to be involved in that and I used to be involved in gangs and I used to steal and I used to lie and I used to cheat. But I quit doing those things and I started going to church. I turned over a new leaf. Now, look, that's great. I think you should do that. I'm glad you did that. But if you're counting on that to get you to heaven, you're going to die and go to hell. Amen. You say, why? Because, look, the law was there to get us to shut our mouths. And they become guilty before God. Notice verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds. Now, what's the word deed mean? It's an action. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Look at verse 28. Same chapter. Skip down to verse 28. Therefore, we conclude. Because Paul's been giving this argument about salvation. And I'm not going to take time to go through the whole chapter. You can read Romans chapter 3 in context uh, in your own time. I would encourage you to do that. But notice what he says in verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I mean, is it clear throughout the Bible? Is it extremely clear that salvation is not by works? Salvation is not by what you do? Salvation is not by keeping a good life? Salvation is not by keeping a rule book? Salvation is not by doing this? It's not by doing that? Salvation is through the faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. I said, number one, we are not justified by works of the law. We're not justified by keeping the commandments. Number two, if we could be justified by the law, then Jesus died for no reason. Number three, if we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. Number four, if we could have been justified by the law, when, uh, then God would have chosen that as a way of salvation and not sacrifice the Son. Number five, the law cannot save us because we're all sinners. We did not keep the law. We broke the law. Number six, the law shows us our guilt in order for us to see our need for a Savior. See, the law, when you look at the law and you compare yourself to the law, you say, wow, I've broken this law. I cannot attain to this law. I need someone to save me. That's the purpose of the law. What does false religion teach? Keep the law and you'll go to heaven. Do the best you can and hopefully God will let you into heaven. No, no, it's not hopefully. I can know that I have eternal life if I'm putting my trust in Jesus Christ. Number seven, you can be justified by faith with no works. You can be justified by faith with no works. You're there in Romans chapter three, go to Romans chapter four. You can be justified by faith with no works. Today you have people will say, They'll say, oh, no, no, salvation is not of works. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. But if you works don't follow, then you weren't really saved. And let me say this. Next week, we're going to be dealing. I don't have time to deal with it in this sermon. Next week, we're going to be dealing with the infamous James chapter 2. You know, James chapter 2. Everybody wants to go to James 2 about, you know, you have to add works to salvation. Faith without works is dead. We're going to look at that next week in depth. But here's, here's what, here's what, it, what people say. No, salvation is not of works, but if you really got saved, then there will be works. If you really got saved, then works will follow. Now, you know, that sounds nice, but what does the Bible say? Romans chapter 4, look at verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Remember, we're talking about Abraham this morning. We're actually going to be talking about this, this part of Romans 4. We're going to be talking about that in Genesis tonight. So I'd encourage you to be here tonight. But here's what Paul says. He says, what is it exactly that that patriarch Abraham found? I mean, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? He said, what is it exactly that Abraham found that got him to start this movement of Christianity and of believing on Jesus? You say, he started Judaism. It's the God of the Bible. He believed, and by the way, that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Notice verse 2. For if, now notice what he says, if. I like Paul because he gives, he, he gives these, you know, plays the devil's advocate. He says, okay, let's say you're right. Notice what he says. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to, can we read that next word together? Together, Notice what it says, glory. Do you see that? Whereof, uh, I'm sorry, he hath whereof to, let's read it together, glory. 
Let's do it again. He hath whereof to glory. Now notice what he says, but not before God. Okay, what does the word glory mean? Here's what it means. It means to boast or brag, to show up. Here's what he's saying. If Abraham was justified by works, if Abraham was justified by the things that he did, then he would have something to glory about, boast about, brag about. You ought to come out soul winning with us. Listen to some people glory in themselves. Hey, do you know if you died today, if you'd be on your way to heaven? Oh, yeah, I'm on my way to heaven. What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Well, if you, if you knew the way I used to live. I mean, I used to drink, and I used to do this, and I used to do that, but, that, but then I got saved. It's funny, your salvation is all about you and not about Jesus. But then I started going to church, and I, you know, I used to cheat on my wife, and I used to do this, but I quit all that. But listen, he says, if Abraham hath, was justified by works, he hath were up to glory. But then he says, but not before God. Because here's the thing, nobody's going to boast or brag before God. Amen. No one's going to show off before, before God. L just look back to Romans 3. Look at verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of, can we read it together? The glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, here's the problem with work salvation is you come short of the glory of God. He says, look, if Abraham, Romans 4, 2, were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. And by the way, let me say this, especially to those that you say, I'm, I'm, I believe that salvation is not of works. I believe that salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. Then do me a favor. When you're giving your testimony, quit talking about yourself. People say, oh, salvation is by works, but then you ask them about their testimony, and it's like, well, let me tell you how I used to live my life. Let me tell you, I used to do this, and I used to do that. If salvation is not of you, why are you talking about so much about yourself in your testimony? Amen. When people ask me about my salvation testimony, you know what I tell them? I say, I was a sinner on my way to hell, but Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I accepted him through faith. It's about Jesus, not about, let me, you know, people got to get into all these weird stories. I mean, sometimes it's, 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 it's just insane. I remember one time my wife and I were at this Christmas party. It was a long time ago, now, before I was even pastoring a church. And there was this old lady that was not a nice-looking lady. And, and, and somebody asked her about her salvation this morning, and she's, she's saying, like, I used to be a prostitute, and I used to do this. And my wife and I are just like, Whoa, okay, let's go somewhere else. You know, we don't, too much information, all right? You, you just came into my emotional bubble. I didn't need to know all that, all right? But here's the thing. Why, why do we talk so much about ourselves in our testimony if salvation is through Jesus Christ? Amen. Why do you have to go on and on and on and on about, and here's all you're doing is just glorifying yourself. Because you think people are impressed with it. Hey, no one's impressed with it. You know who we're impressed with? Jesus Christ. So keep your testimony to Jesus Christ. Knows what he says. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath word of the glory, but not before God. Verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Now look, in verse 2 he said, you know, if Abraham was justified by works, he said, let's say you're right, and it's through works. But then in verse 3 he says, for what saith the scripture? So now he says, well, what does the Bible say? What does the word of God say? And that's a question we should always ask. What saith the scripture? Whenever we're thinking about doctrines, well, what does the Bible say? Well, I was taught when I was a child. It doesn't matter what you were taught when you were a child. What does the Bible say? Well, my religion teaches. It doesn't matter what your religion teaches. What saith the scripture? That's the question we all ought to be asking. Notice what he says, verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Well, here's what the scripture said. Here's a quote from the Old Testament. Abraham believed. Notice that's faith. Abraham believed God and it. What? His faith. His belief. The word it is referring back to belief. You, you ought to, you ought to write a, a, draw an arrow from the word it to the word belief. He says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What was counted unto him for righteousness? His belief. How was, people say, in the Old Testament, they were saved by works. According to the Bible, Abraham was saved by faith. He believed. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Look at verse 4. Not to him that worketh, not to him that worketh, he said, look, if you want to go ahead and work your way to heaven, that's fine. You can believe whatever you want. You don't have to change your religion because you came to Verity Baptist Church. But here's what Paul says. He says, but to him that worketh is the reward. What's the reward? Eternal life. What's the reward? What's the gift? Heaven. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned. What's the word reckoned? That's an old word. It's, you know, I think they still use it in the South. I reckon, right? What's the word reckon mean? It means to count, to compute, to calculate. Here's what he's saying. Now to him that worketh, if you want to earn it, if you want to work for it, is the reward, is the prize, is the gift, eternal life, heaven. Not reckoned, not counted, not computed, not calculated of grace, but of death. 
Now, what's the word grace mean? The theological term, which I'll impress you with with all my knowledge, is unmerited favor. We, don't, we, we like to use plain words at Verity Baptist Church. We try to preach in a way where even a theologian can understand it, you know? Here's what the word grace means, free. You ever heard of a grace period? You got mortgage due on the first, but they, call it, they give you till the fifth to pay it. They call that a grace period, right? It's just free time. Unmerited favor means I'm receiving favor I did not merit. I did not deserve. I did not earn. I was not supposed to get. He says, look what he says. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace. Here's what he's saying. It's not free, but of debt. You say, why is it of debt? Remember we saw in Galatians 5.3, you don't have to turn there, but he said that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Because here's the thing, if you want to try to keep the law, you're going to be in debt the rest of your life. You cannot do enough good things to make up for the bad things you've already done. There's not enough good things you can do to pay off the debt. So he says, look, not to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Notice verse 5, but to him that worketh not. Now look, it doesn't say to him that worketh a little bit. It doesn't say to him that worketh some. It doesn't say to him that worketh, you know, there's going to be something there. I mean, there's going to be some fruit to show. It says to him that worketh not. This guy did nothing. He never went to church, never got baptized, never repented of anything, never did anything right. But here's what he did do. But believeth. He, he had faith on him that justified the ungodly. Notice, his faith is counted for righteousness. So does the Bible teach that someone could have faith and absolutely no works and still be saved, according to Romans 4? Yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, no, no, no. If you got saved, there will be works. I mean, if you really got saved, then there's going to be something to show. No, no, no. The Bible says, what saith this Christian? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. See, what, what matters is not what your religion teaches. What matters is what does the Bible say? Amen. What does the Word of God say? Do, can you be saved with no works before or after? The answer is yes. Notice verse 6. Even as David. Here we have an, another Old Testament character. Well, in the Old Testament, they had to keep the sacrifices to be saved. That's what theologians try to tell us. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. What's the word imputeth mean or impute? It means to attribute, to ascribe. God imputeth righteousness with out works. I mean, there comes a point in the sermon where I'm just beating a dead horse. You know what I mean? There comes a point where there's just so many verses. And here's what's the funny thing. People are going to walk out of here and say, well, I'm just going to be a Catholic for the rest of my life because that's what my mom was. Well, I'm just going to believe, you know, that I have to repent of my sins for the rest of my life because that's what my daddy taught me. And you're going to die and go to hell. Because if you think you've got to keep the law, if you, think you gotta, if you think righteousness comes by keeping the law, you've got to keep the whole law. And here's the problem with that. You can't keep the whole law. I can't keep the whole law. Salvation is through Jesus Christ because we needed him. Because we were not good enough. Because we came short. I said, number one, we are not justified by the works of the law or by keeping the commandments. Number two, if we could be justified by the law, then Jesus died for no reason. Number three, if we are justified by the law, then we must keep the entire law. Number four, if we could have been justified by the law, then God would have chosen that as a way for salvation and not sacrifice his son. Number five, the law cannot save us because we're all sinners. We did not keep the law. We broke the law. Number six, the law shows us our guilt in order for us to see our need for a savior. Number seven, you can be justified by faith with no works. Number eight, if salvation is of grace, meaning it's free, then you cannot add works. You cannot earn it. People, say, people have said this to me. I'll, I'll explain this to them at their door and go through and explain. The, and they'll say, well, I, I understand that the Bible says it's, it's by grace, but I just still want to add my works to it. Like, I still want to just add my works. Like, even though I don't have to, I want to add my works just to kind of put my, my you know, two cents in. Well, here's the question. What does the scripture say? Go to Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 6. Romans chapter 11. Now, what does the word grace mean? It means free. What is works? To earn something. You're earning it. Okay? When you go to work and your boss gives you a paycheck, he doesn't say, here, I wanted to give you a gift. No, that's not a gift. I earned that. I've been work I worked for 40 hours last week. You know, that's, that, you, you're not giving me anything. I earned it. Right? So, grace is free. Works is to earn something. Notice Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 6. He says, and if by grace, he says, if it's free, then it is no more works. 
Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Now look, is that really that difficult to understand? Here's what he's saying. If it's free, then you can't earn it. If it's free, then you can't pay for it. Otherwise, it's not free. I mean, he says, and if it be grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And just in case you didn't understand that, because you got a Bible college degree that causes you to not understand scripture, <laughs> notice what he says. But if it be of works, if it's earned, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What's he saying? He's saying, if you earn it, then it's not free. Otherwise, you're not earning it. So you can't sit here and say, oh, no, no, no. Because these ones with these theologians, these scholars who are supposed to be impressed with all their degrees, tell us, no, it's grace, but you also have to add works. No, no, no. If I add works, then it's not grace. If I have to pay you, then it's not free. If I have to earn it, then it's not free. And if I earn it, then it's not free. And if it's free, then I don't have to earn it. If it's free, then I don't have to work for it. If it's free, then I don't have to do anything for it other than accept it. Go to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians, you're there in Romans. You're going to go past the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians into Galatians. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 2. We're almost done. Well, <laughs> almost is a relative term. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 8. We're on the last page, how about that? Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 8. We can do it quickly. For by grace, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace, what's grace? Free. For by grace are ye saved, saved from where? From hell, because we don't want to go there, right? Through faith. What's faith? To believe. And that not of yourselves. Listen, he says if you're going to be saved, it's not of yourself. If you're going to be saved, it's not something you do, not something you produce, not something you make. Why? Because, notice what he says, it is the gift of God. See, a gift is free. A gift you don't earn for. If I tell you I'm going to give you a birthday gift, but you've got to give me $20, that's not a gift. You're paying me for it. If I tell you I'm going to give you a birthday gift, but you've got to wash my car, that's not a gift. You're working for it. And today you've got all these religions saying, God wants to give you a gift of salvation, but you have to get baptized. Now look, you're in a Baptist church. We believe in baptism. We think you ought to get baptized. If you haven't been baptized, you should be baptized. But guess what? You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. You just believe on Jesus Christ to go to heaven. Should you be baptized? Yes. To go to heaven? No. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Plus nothing, minus nothing. It's all Jesus. Notice what it says. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that out of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Notice verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. Let's, let's look at it somewhere else. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You're there in Ephesians? You're going to go past Philippians, past Colossians, into 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy. So you got Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. Notice what he says. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Who hath saved us, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Go to Titus chapter 3. You're there in 2 Timothy. Just one book over to Titus. Titus chapter 3. Look at verse 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regenerating and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I mean, could it be any more clear than that? Amen. Am I saved by works? No, no, not by works of righteousness which we have done. And, and, and the Bible tells us that our, our righteousnesses are as filthy racks. There's nothing to glory about in the good things you've done. Anything good that I've done has been by the mercy and grace of God. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regenerating and renewing the Holy Ghost. Now, we're, we're getting ready to finish here. I want to give you a couple of statements to conclude the sermon. You're there in, 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 in Titus. Go, go to the book of 1 Peter. You're going to go past Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. So you're in Titus. You're going to go Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Now when you get to 1 Peter, keep your finger there and go to Matthew. Because I want to show you something in Matthew. But you're so close to 1 Peter, I want to get you there first. 
Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Keep your finger in, in 1 Peter, and then go to the book of Matthew. First book in the New Testament. It should be fairly easy to find. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 16. Let me just answer this as we conclude this morning. People say, Oh, well, if you teach people that salvation is not of works, if you teach people that salvation, you know, that you don't have to do anything to be saved, just believe, you're giving people a license to sin. You know, last time I checked, I didn't think we had to give people a license to sin. People are pretty good at just un unlicensed sinning. They just sin with no license. They don't get permission. They just do what they want. And people say, well, you're just telling people, listen to me, we're not telling people you can do whatever you want. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says that God is a father who chasteneth his children. We're not saying do whatever you want and nothing's going to happen to you on earth. God may correct you. God may discipline you. You may reap what you sow. But listen, we are saying that once you believe on Jesus Christ, you can do whatever you want and still be saved because salvation is not of works. Amen. My children had to do nothing to be my children, just be born. And how they act does not determine whether they are my children or not. It determines whether they get spankings or not. It determines whether we go to Cold Stone or not. But it doesn't determine whether they're my children. They were my children by birth. And Jesus said, ye must be born again. Amen. If you're born into the family of God, you're his child. Nothing you do will change that. Now, now should we, we're not saved by works. But should we have works in our life? Are you there in Matthew? Look at chapter 5, verse 16. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. Notice what Jesus said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Should we have good works? Yes. You know, and here's the interesting thing about, about our, our, our church. I go out and I talk to people and I talk to them about salvation and they're like, oh, no, no, you have to, you know, you have to go to the confessional booth. You have to get catechized. You have to do this. And these are the same people that are getting drunk on Saturday night and just going to some confessional booth on Sunday and getting some guy to tell them, you know, to uh, do certain things and, uh, you know, say certain things. And, and now you're fine. And then you come to Verity Baptist Church, and we're telling you you can do whatever you want. Salvation is by grace through faith. There's nothing you can do to lose it. And then we're just preaching hard against sin. We're trying to get you to get the sin out of your life. We're telling you to quit fornicating and quit drinking and quit being lazy and stop watching the television and, 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 and get right with God and read the Bible and pray and go soul winning. You say, well, why? Because, look, we're not saying don't do works. We're just saying works don't save you. Amen. But should we do works? Absolutely. Find a church in Sacramento that's preaching harder than this church. Find the church of Sacramento is trying to get people to get sent out of their life as hard as we are here. We're not saying don't do works. We're just saying if you're trusting your works to save, you're going to die and go to hell. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now keep your finger there in Matthew. We're going to come right back to it, but go to 1 Peter. All right, so you should have a finger in 1 Peter. Now you have a finger in Matthew. I know it's getting complicated. Keep your finger in Matthew, but go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by, notice what he says, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know why the world is not glorifying God? Because Christians are not living up to works. Because we're not living right. Now, do we have to live right to be saved? No, but you know what? We should live right. We should have a good testimony. We shouldn't, you shouldn't be the laziest guy at your job. Where people say, oh yeah, the, the Christian, he's the lazy one. The Christian, he's the one that can't show up on time. The, list, the Christian, he's the one that can't figure out when break's done. You know, you ought to have a good testimony. You ought to have a good, we ought to do good works that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That they would, he said that by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God. So even though we are not saved by works, once you are saved, you should work. Once you are saved, you should get to work. And at Verity Baptist Church, we push that a lot. Why do we want you to go soul winning? Because we want you to get to work. Why do we ask you to come back on Sunday night and Wednesday night? Why do we ask you to read the Bible? Why do we ask you to pray? Why do we ask you to give? Why do we ask you to do all these things? Because we are to get to work. We are supposed to work. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So even though we're not saved by works, once we are saved, we should work. Keep your finger there in Matthew. Go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. 
You say, well, what happens if you die trusting in your works? What happens if you die and you are trusting in your works? And I don't understand this Christianity. I, I, something I've noticed people do is they'll just pretend when someone dies, no matter what they believe, no matter what they believe, they were saved. I mean, this person was a Jehovah's Witness. I had one time this lady told me, my grandmother was a Jehovah's Witness who denies the deity of Christ, who says that Jesus was an angel, not God in the flesh, who denies the Trinity, who denies the resurrection, that Jesus did not resurrect from the grave, who thinks that you have to live a good life, and then they passed away and they're like, well, yeah, she was a Jehovah's Witness, she believed all the things, but I know she was saved. I'm just like, okay, just put your head in the sand if that's what you need to do. You know, my Catholic mother died, but I know she was saved. I mean, she believed in work salvation and the priest had to come and give her her last, you know, rights before she died. Otherwise, she was going to go to hell. She was trusting in that priest to save her. But no, I know she was saved. Look, my, my wife's grandmother lived with us for nine months. She was a Catholic. We tried to give her the gospel multiple times. She's never, she never accepted it. We love her. But we're not lying to ourselves and saying she didn't believe the right thing. We, we tried to give her the gospel over and over and over and, 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 and pleaded with her to be saved. And she, she told my wife, I was born a Catholic, I'll die a Catholic. And she died a Catholic. She died trusting in her works. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, well, I know she was saved. I mean, she was the one unique, special one that didn't have to believe. No, no, no. Salvation is by works. Don't lie to yourself. Don't tell yourself, oh, this one person, because they're related to you. Notice what, notice what the Bible says. You're, well, what happens to someone who dies? And look, I'm not, we, we weep over my wife's grandmother. We, we loved her. She lived with us. My wife took care of her for almost a year. But she didn't believe right. By the way, this is why we've given our lives to preach the gospel to people. Because what happens to someone who dies trusting in their works? Are you there in Revelation chapter 20? Look at verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. One day there's a great white throne coming. This is the judgment of unbelievers. Believers will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. I preached a sermon on that recently in the Crown series. I'm not going to go there this morning. But the believers will be judged that was called the great white throne. Notice, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place in them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books. Notice, according to their works. You say, well, what's that about? Why are they being judged according to their works? Here's why they're being judged according to their works. Because if you want to meet God and be judged by your works, he will judge you by your works. If you want to get to heaven and say, God, let me try to give you all the good things I've done and see if that will let me in. God says, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's try it. Now, how's that work out for you? Okay, go to Matthew. Go to Matthew. You say, no, I don't think that's what they're doing. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 22. Notice what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Notice what Jesus said. Many will say to me in that day, in what day? The day of judgment, the great white throne. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful what? Works. He said, Jesus said, people are going to come to me in that day and say, but I did all these works. I did all these things. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work, work iniquity. See, look, when I get to heaven, if God said to me, why should I let you into heaven? I'm not going to say, well, I was a pastor of a church. And I lived a good life. And I, you know, I drove by the speed limit. No, you know what I would say if God said, why should I get into heaven? I would say because Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, because I accepted him as my savior, because I'm a sinner and deserve to go to hell, but you gave by grace, you saved me. That's what I would say. Why are these people saying, but we cast out devils and we did many wonderful works because that's what they're trusting to get them to heaven. And God says, you want me to judge you by your works? I'll judge you by your works. But here's the problem. When you get judged by your works, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It reminds me of the verse, and you don't have to turn there, but in the book of Daniel, Daniel is interpreting a prophecy for Belshazzar, and he, and he said in his prophecy, he said, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Look, if you want to get judged by your works, God says, I'll judge you, but here's the problem. You're not going to measure up. You're going to fail. And that's why there in the book of Revelation, it tells us that they were cast into the lake of fire. 
Because if you get judged by your works, you're not going to make it. Look, you can compare your life to my life and say, well, compared to Pastor Jimenez, I'm pretty good. And I'm sure you are. I can, compare, I can find someone and say, well, compared to brother so-and-so, I'm pretty good. But here's the problem with that. The standard is God. And when we get to heaven, we have to be as good as God. And if you're not as good as God, then you come short. You'll be found wanting. Let me give you one last verse. We're done. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 25.